right so good afternoon everyone uh, today i'm going to talk about uh, uh, reasoning based conversation systems and uh, we all know that conversation systems are happening all around us and uh, there are different varieties and sophistications of conversation systems so i'll talk a little bit about that and then i'll focus on reasoning based conversation system two of them uh, that we are working on all right but before i get there I wanted to share a very nice video which kind of shows the future of uh, conversation system. So this is from Star Trek um, and I hope the audio will come. Uh... Computer, interface with the minus array. Activate the control matrix. Matrix activated. Full power to the graviton emitters. Emitters powering. Scan the area surrounding the array for a class B itinerant pulsar. A pulsar has been detected at coordinates 227 by 41 mark 6. Good, good. Direct a 60 terawatt tachyon beam toward the pulsar. Tachyon beam initiated. All right. So hopefully you got the idea that you know the the you know the imagination of what a conversation system can be. Uh, you know we have very high um, end goals of what a conversation system could be, and this is just an example of how we imagine a future conversation system might look like. Uh, it'll be able to do many, many things like we saw today in, in this video, right? So the question is, um, you know, how do we get there? How do we build uh, towards such a conversation system which can act on your um, utterances, which can give you information, which can do speculation, which can do computation, which can do reasoning, right? So, so there's a lot of uh, hope that we'll be able to create such advanced uh, conversation systems. So before I get there, I just want to talk about the four big paradigm shifts that I see that are going to happen as we move into this direction. So the first one is uh, that, you know, we still think that the world is actually a collection of documents, blogs, tweets and images and Instagram photos, but actually it is not. The world is actually made up of entities, events, attributes, relationships and ontologies. So we are going to move away and we have seen the, uh, you know, this transition we're going to move away from document centric thinking to knowledge centric thinking about the world around us. And this is a very big paradigm shift. Uh, the second is uh, we still do search, but what we need from the likes of Google is not search. We now need action. So we're going to move away from search centric paradigms to action centric paradigms. And, and uh, this is also something we are seeing every day. Uh, the third big paradigm shift is um, you know, today, if you look at your phone, it is, you know, it is made up of many, many apps and uh, you don't order food. First, you pick the app to order a food. So we are still surrounded by apps first. We are not user centric. We are app centric. And now we are going to move towards assistant centric like Alexa and Siri, uh, which will be a universal app for all things that we need. Uh, that's a third big paradigm shift. And the fourth big paradigm shift that we are going to see is multimodality. The way we interact with our devices today is mostly touch and clicks, but now we're gonna see how more natural interfaces like speech and vision and gesture and emotion will come to uh, help us interact with our devices. So these are the context in which uh, we'll talk about uh, conversation systems. Uh, so as, you, as we all know, right, interfaces are evolving. We started with touch-based interface, then conversational, and now speech-based interfaces. And this is going to continue to become better as we build our speech systems uh, for all languages of the world, for all dialects, for all accents, and all this will continue to evolve. And our interaction with machines will become even more uh, seamless uh, than what we have today. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about the different ways to look at, uh, you know, a conversation system. And there are different aspects to a uh, conversation system. I, I'm trying to put them in a space uh and and come up with different aspects so 
the first thing is who started it right uh, and when kids have a fight we talk about who started it uh, but really there are two kinds of conversation system if you think about push versus pull so when you get a notification it's a push when you initiate a conversation it's a pull uh, so that is one dimension the second is how is the flow and uh, the flow can be very linear like when you book a flight you have a very linear set of things to do but when you are doing an IBR system inside a bank and say press one for this, press two for that, then there's a tree structure around that and that can be a different flow than a linear flow. Uh, third is, does the user matter, right? So sometimes the conversation systems are very generic. You know, it's the same for all of us, but sometimes you can make them highly personalized, right? And because it knows your electronic health record, because it knows your preferences, you can make the conversations more personalized than one size fits all generics. Uh, does the context matter? So sometimes it is context free, no matter where you are, if you talk to it, it's the same, con you know, there's no context information, but sometimes, you know, it is context aware. Like for example, the time of day, uh, the GPS of your location, uh, what was the last uh, five things you did today? And then that becomes the context and the conversation systems can adapt to the context also. Uh, the next is, does the state matter? Do you remember what happened earlier versus is the next thing completely independent of the previous thing? So we'll talk about stateless versus stateful conversation systems. And the last dimension is, does it adapt? As in, is it a very static system, whether it is branching, linear, personalized or not, is it static? Or does, is it very dynamic in the sense that, you know, whatever conversation we had so far guides the next uh, set of conversation, right? So it's less programmed and a lot more uh, adaptable. So these are some of the aspects to consider when we think of a conversation system. Now, what I'll do is I'll present uh, degrees of sophistication of conversation systems that we have built, we have seen, we have been using for the last 20 years, but I'm just going to put them in a, in a, uh, in a single slide so we all understand that these are all variants of a increasingly complex conversation system so a level one conversation system in my mind is just all the alerts and notifications and advisories and reminders that we get and we get a lot of them and we don't think of them as a conversation system but it is a type of conversation that a system is having with the humans uh, the level two is all the structured and unstructured search systems we have been using for the last 20 years. I'm going to think of them as a level two conversation systems where you put in a query and a result comes, whether it is structured query like SQL or unstructured query. So databases and all that, this is also um, a conversation system. Level three uh, is now we are getting into factored questions and text to intent based um work and this is the level three and this is where a lot of uh you know the googles of the world are working on how do we at least master factoid based question answering and and uh, intent based uh, actions and these are level three uh chatbots in my mind level four is what i call reasoning based question answering which is more advanced than for factoid based question answering and today we're going to spend a little bit of time on what reasoning based question answering is and why is that an important part of AI. Level five is what we call a static, stateless, linear conversation. So it's a very linear conversation. You do first step, then you move to the next step, then you move to the next step. It's very static uh, and it is very stateless. What you did in the previous step does not affect the next step. Uh, so for example, when you're booking a flight and there is a five stage process, it's a very static, stateless, linear conversation. Level six is now a branching version of the same thing. Depending on what you did, you go to a different branch and now the conversation systems can have a lot more branching factor than just a static linear. Uh, level seven is what we call a dynamic stateful conversation, which is how the conversation evolves based on what has happened so far. And we're gonna spend some time on level seven today also and talk about diagnosis as a conversation system. And level eight is if you are able to personalize and contextualize your dynamic conversations, and that is what the video showed, that we are now able to personalize and contextualize the whole thing, right? So these are my thoughts around the different levels of conversation system. This is not an industry standard or something, but I really wanted to 
captured the entire spectrum of conversation systems. And now we'll talk about level four and level seven as we go along. So very quickly, level one, we all know uh, alerts, you know, even a very simple uh, light going up saying low fuel is also a conversation system because the system is conversing with us. Uh, messages you get on SMS on alerts, uh, notifications of all type, a packet has been delivered, money has been transferred, uh, you know, a coupon that has come or a new song that has been added to a library, right? So these are all different examples of notifications we keep getting. This is all level level one conversations. Uh, reminders that we get, uh, don't worry, this is uh, this is the PPT. Uh, you don't have a meeting in five minutes, uh, but you know we are very used to these kind of reminders. Uh, people are getting reminders for their medicines. We are getting reminders for our flights. So these are also examples of conversation systems. Um, advisories, a lot of times we are now building advisory systems where we can give a farmer an advisory about what to do every day what pests, what fertilizers, what uh, when to harvest, uh, where to sell, or weather advisories and all that. So these are all uh, sort of the basic conversation systems we've already built and we use them every day. Uh, and uh, now let's move on to level two. Level two conversation systems, structured and unstructured search. So if we look at structured search, right? When we narrow down our search by different structured parameters, uh, when we go through a structured form filling exercise and say, you know, fill these fields and then the whole thing will happen. There's an SQL that runs in the background or when we are looking for a property and we have to fill some structured fields, right? So these are all examples of structured search, which is also a type of level two conversation. Unstructured search, we are all very familiar with uh, text based, keyword based search or image based search or voice based search. So these are all part of unstructured search. So you have a large corpus and how do we search for stuff and stuff. All right, so let's move on to the factoid based question answering. And, and you know, the factoid based now has been mastered by the likes of Google a lot. If you just type in a query like Prime Minister of India without even looking at a web page, the answer comes, right? And, um, and now we have mastered the art of uh, all kinds of queries which are factoid which has a place in our knowledge graph can be very quickly answered without even having to go to a web page. So search has evolved into factoid based question answering. And now this is possible for a lot of uh, questions that have this nature. And how does it work? Uh, well, you know, imagine you have a knowledge graph. We talked about the paradigm shift from document centric to knowledge centric. And now, uh, you know, as soon as you do this, it recognizes that the art of war is a book. And then it goes through who wrote, it knows what kind of predicate it is looking for, and it can very quickly give you the fact associated with it if it is present in the knowledge graph. So that is our, uh, you know, the next level of things. We can also not only do facts, but also lists. So what are the different art styles? And, you know, I'm getting a list of things. What are the different movies? I can get a list instead of just a single answer. I can get a list as an answer. So now we are there and the foundation technology for that, obviously there's partly deep learning, but there's partly knowledge graph. And knowledge graphs are going to become as important in any vertical as deep learning and machine learning are today, right? And if you are not using knowledge graphs, please consider. Uh, and the idea is you have an entity, you can think of all types of attributes, whether it is static, operational, dynamic, you can think of all types of predicates associated with it. They're standard or domain centric. Uh, you can associate names in all languages with an entity ID. Um, you can think about features associated with that entity, um, like of, you know uh, features that are derived from uh, transaction data. You can think about the kind of models you can build on those entities. Uh, you can think of actions you can take on those entities, and you can associate content with those entities. So. Really, I'm expanding the scope of what a knowledge graph is and can do, but this is a foundational infrastructure that is needed to do at least factoid based and what we're going to talk about reasoning based question answers. So now let's spend some time on reasoning based question answering. And uh, here the idea is uh, the following. So let me take some examples and then we'll see what are the critical elements we need to solve this problem. So when I ask a question like, which is the longest river in India? you don't have a direct answer sitting in a knowledge graph, 
but we know how to find that answer from the knowledge graph. So these are the steps that are needed. And then we'll see that some of these steps are still not clear how to build them, right? So the first part of it is to interpret the question, which means annotate all the entities, all the entity types and all of that, all the attributes, all the predicates. Uh, if there is ambiguity, disambiguate that. And how do you understand the question and annotate it with the right uh, primitives like this? And then the hard problem starts, which is how do you now analyze this question and generate what we call a reasoning program? So the idea is we have understood the question at some level of abstraction. We need to now convert it to the next level of executable level of abstraction. And really to solve this problem, we have to create a program which is saying, hey, first give me all the you know, rivers in the country, India. So I get a list of rivers from the knowledge graph. Then I want to know what are their lengths. So I get all the attributes in the key value store. And then I want to apply an argmax on top of those to get the answer, right? So reasoning-based question answering has a critical requirement that we should be able to generate such a reasoning program for every question that comes along. And this is very different from keyword-based search. We know how to do it, no matter how complex the query is. We can do a matching between a query and a document, but reasoning-based question answering is still not uh, there yet, right? After 20 years of Google, we are still struggling with reasoning-based question answer. Another example, uh, which was the highest grossing movie of Amitabh Bachchan last year? Amitabh Bachchan is a famous actor in India. Uh, and now, again, we have to understand uh, uh, deeply what, what the, you know, annotate every aspect of the question. Uh, this is a movie, highest means aggregate max, grossing means movie revenue, movies, an entity type, predicate, person, acted in movie, Amitabh Bachchan is a given entity, and last year, how do you interpret that? And now the real question I'm asking is, can this be done with embeddings, right? So we all love text embeddings, we love deep learning and all that, but embeddings have their limitation. Embeddings can do certain kinds of things well, but reasoning is the other half of AI. So I think of uh, you know uh, AI as a combination of reasoning systems, symbolic reasoning, and deep learning systems coming together, and that's when we are going to achieve our vision of artificial general intelligence. Right. So again, how to do this? Um, the problem is how do you analyze the question and build a reasoning program? And the program is not trivial. And the program says, hey, first give me all the movies by this person, uh, then tell me their release dates and then uh, filter them by the year 2021, and then give me all their revenue, and then give me the argmax of that, right? So the key to reasoning-based questions is to understand the text and to create a program. Solving the program is easy. Creating the program is the key problem, right? So if I think of this four-stage process that we went through, interpret the question well, uh, which means annotate everything, analyze the question, generate a reasoning program in terms of the knowledge graph primitives, generate the answer by executing the reasoning program, and then synthesizing the answer in any language, converting that knowledge back to language. And in all of this, if I ask which is the hardest open problem out of all these four, so interpreting the question is an NLP problem, synthesizing an answer is an NLG problem, both of them seem to be solved, Answering the question, generating the answer is easy once you know what the program is. We have APIs for knowledge graph. So the key to reasoning-based question answering is generating the reasoning program automatically for all kinds of reasoning questions. And that is where I think the next wave of AI is going to be. And in my mind, if we solve that reasoning problem along with deep learning uh, paradigms, we are going to get one more step closer to artificial general intelligence. So how do you generate such a program on the fly for any kind of a reasoning question is the key, which uh, is still an open problem. And uh, maybe in the next year, next version of ODSC, I'll talk about how we are solving that problem. Okay. So now let me switch gears. Uh, let me talk about uh, a next type of conversation system, which is uh, sort of like a you know, dynamic, stateful conversation system. And we are going to talk about diagnosis as a case study here. Um, so if you look at what is going on in the world of healthcare, 
uh, a lot of us are not getting the right diagnosis at the right time because of many, many reasons. And these are WHO numbers that there are 2.6 million deaths happening because of wrong prescription, wrong diagnosis and all of that. Uh, so how do we deal with this problem? We cannot have a great diagnostic doctor present in every nook and corner of the world, uh, especially you know third world countries. So how do we solve this problem? How can we create a diagnostic AI which can solve this problem? Now diagnosis, as I have learned uh, from our mentor, Dr. Chetan Bhatt, is that is a very, very subjective process. Every doctor will interpret your symptoms very differently, depending on their knowledge of medical science and their ability to reason over what you are saying. And this is what makes diagnosis a very, very subjective process. Um, and obviously the problem is even worse because there are not enough great doctors across the world who can do diagnosis well. So there is a need for building what we call an AI assisted diagnostic system, which is very holistic, which can diagnose all possible diseases and which is very precise that the top three diagnoses are the ones that you actually have. So how do we do it? And uh, I'll talk about our architecture for that, right? So this is the general uh, journey in the healthcare world. You start with some initial symptoms and let's say the AI assisted doctor will talk to you and say, what are the other symptoms and all that? And you get a preclinical diagnosis, which are the top five diseases the doctor thinks might be the problem. Then now imagine a doctor approves the AI uh, preclinical diagnosis. And then we decide whether we need further investigation. If we do, we suggest a bunch of investigation once we know the top five diseases doctor approves the investigations, then we create the reports or we receive the reports, then post-clinical diagnosis happens, which is to understand the reports. Doctor approves the post-clinical diagnosis created by AI. And then there is an assisted prescription, which is again personalized to the patient uh, based on allergies and other medications. Doctor approves the prescription and then the, we get the patient feedback. Now in this whole journey, which we call a symptom to cure journey, this is the hardest problem. How do you do the diagnosis is the most critical and the hardest problem. So let me talk about how the architecture looks like. So here we start with the you know, patient has an utterance that he says, I have fever, I have stomach ache, what have you. And then we maintain a state of the conversation. We update the state and say, this is the symptom state of the conversation so far. And then using that, like a doctor thinks about the current set of diseases that would be possible given this set of symptoms that the patient is telling me, we deduce the disease state. So it's an observed versus unobserved part. So there are two parts of the state here. And then if you are very confident about the diagnosis, we say this is the diagnosis. And if not, then we say there are some more follow-up questions. Do you also have cough? Do you also have cold? And then we ask those questions and uh, they are either rule-based questions or reasoning-based questions. And then the patient answers those questions and the cycle continues, right? So this is kind of a stateful, dynamic conversation system uh, as an example of uh, an AI doctor. So today we have built um, a knowledge base of more than 10,000 connections between diseases and symptoms and attributes. Uh, and we have reached a very high accuracy. The next best uh, system out there is only 70% accurate, while we are almost 95% accurate, 99% accurate that uh, you know, in the top five diseases that AI doctor is suggesting based on three symptoms, we are 99% accurate, right? So it's a very high accuracy diagnosis system. And now I'll just show you one example of that uh, so that we can wrap up in time and then we'll take some questions. So here is a triage. Um, so the way it works, and we're going to launch this hopefully this year. Uh, so what we do, we take age and gender of the patient. We take the initial symptoms. The patient has said, I have fever, headache, uh, and all of that. Uh, and then we say, okay, what are your attributes for each of those symptoms? So if these are what we call uh, rule-based or guideline-based question, because if you have said, I have fever, I must ask you a certain follow-up question. So how much is the fever? Since how long? What is the pattern and all that? And imagine these are the answers the patient is giving uh, then for headache, I will ask you another set of, for, of uh, questions, visual, if, uh, if it is requiring visual, where is the headache, uh, you know, how severe, how long, uh, how does it get, uh, you know, relieved and all of that. Uh, so these are all guideline-based questions because you have talked about headache. And now 
the doctor, the AI doctor has formed an opinion based on the input so far, what might the diseases be? And now we are going to ask you questions which are very relevant to distinguishing the top disease from the others to get a differential diagnosis. And this is the term that doctors use, which is how do I differentiate the first from the rest or second is from the first? And now these questions have to be created with AI reasoning to actually say, what are the next questions I should ask? And these questions will be very different from the questions we will ask if you had given me another set of symptoms. And now we are asking, do you have excessive drowsiness, vomit, all of this? And you answer yes, no. Uh, again, the system is not confident yet, so it is going to ask even follow-up questions uh, and so on and so forth. And finally, uh, it is still not sure. So she still it is asking follow-up questions. So convergence has not happened. And uh, uh, once it is asked and removed all the secondary and get more confident on the primary, then it is ready to say, okay, you know, you have cerebral malaria. This is my most important diagnosis. And this is the rest of it. Yeah. So this was the journey uh, so far. I wanted to cover both reasoning as an important tool and stateful conversation as an important construct. And uh, these are two very hard problems still. Uh, we have not mastered them, but uh, that's where hopefully we'll get. Uh, so the key takeaways are uh, the next generation concept, uh, con conversation systems will be a lot more reasoning centric and not as much NLP centric. NLP is a solved problem uh, in, most lang in, in some of the languages at least, but solving for reasoning is going to become more and more critical. Uh, lookups and factoid is not reasoning, right? Uh, and within the reasoning world, I think generating that reasoning program is still an unsolved problem. And that I think is the key to the artificial general intelligence, because if we solve that well, then we have really raised the bar on what AI can do. And, uh, you know, compared to keyword search in Google or SQL search in databases, which are very generic frameworks, irrespective of what kind of a thing you want to do, uh, reasoning based questions are not yet generalized. There's no general way to generate a program all the time. So the key to AI is not to answer the question, but to generate the program. And that is a very important distinction I want to make that that is the key to how we will solve this. Uh, how do we represent the observed state, which is the state uh, symptom state, for example, but more importantly, how do we uh, you know, represent the latent state, which is the disease state, which is what is going on in the background. Right, so we have observed versus latent. How do we think about state in both dimensions? And then how do we decide convergence? And finally, how do we generate the next question? Because my, my conversation has an end goal and I'm trying to optimize the number of questions I want to ask to get to the end goal. So how do I eliminate you know, the, the other diseases and confirm the top disease? Uh, you know, uh, we, we are now contemplating that these kind of conversation systems uh, will uh, be the next generation advisory systems also. So one of the areas we are also looking at is how do we do this, let's say in the agriculture domain, where imagine a farmer is asking you, how do we, uh, you know, what, uh, what do I do for my crop and how do I take care of this? And now imagine these conversation systems will become even more multimodal, uh, which is, uh, you know, they'll be able to take an input as an image uh, and uh, then predict what is the disease and then have also integrate, you know, data from satellite, data from soil IoT, data from other places. So these are the context that can be added to the current conversation. And these are multimodal uh, data that can be added to then give a perfect advisory to the farmer. So this is another example of the level eight uh, uh, the level eight uh, conversation system, which is contextual in nature, highly personalized to that farmer. And uh, we can give advisories which say, hey, you know, you are growing a particular crop. We know what crop you're growing. We know what soil you have. We know what is the soil moisture content. We know that it is going to rain tomorrow. And we know, according to the knowledge graph of uh, uh, agriculture, that such a such crop does not need more water. So I'm going to generate an irrigation advisory for you. So the future of conversation systems is not just uh, task completion 
uh, but also diagnosis is one area we just talked about and deep advisory deep personalized advisory for everything right whether it is uh, farming or health or all of that so uh, so the purpose is we are going to be able to scale the experts in every domain how do you scale a doctor to become an ai doctor how do you scale a agriculture scientist to become uh, an ai agriculture scientist so that we can scale all the human expertise uh, which is possible with ai and second we can also personalize it uh, because of the convergence of all the other sources of data that we can collect about that context so these are the two big areas that i think um, you know conversation systems will go and hopefully we can uh, help the society with with the next level of organizing the world's information is a conversation system which is advisory diagnosis and and holistic in nature multimodal and very precise and personal okay. you said the one of the next gen conversation will be reasoning and then there's going to be a problem in language speech and language problems do you think because now we are centralized in using english for this conversation system do you think it it needs to evolve from the most uh, primitive type of conversations like you said notifications and everything or it mm -hmm. can be developed along with the growth of conversation system um, and yeah. It, yeah. it can uh, apply uh, in yeah. a more sophisticated system um, yes so you're very right i think one of the paradigm shifts that we saw earlier was that we live in a document centric world so we only think about corpus based nlp and one of the areas where nlp is going to grow is what i call knowledge aware nlp so uh, you know completely doing uh, you know corpus based everything thought vectors word embeddings paragraph embeddings all the way to bert and, and uh, gpt3 i think you know one of the things that uh, we need to recognize is that humans do not understand language the way we are teaching machines how to understand language we don't understand language by reading millions and billions of documents and then saying now i understand meanings of words and sentences right we understand language not in isolation of the knowledge that we already have about the world so knowledge aware nlp as opposed to purely corpus aware nlp is going to be the next big thing so for example here when i see this sentence i don't want to put this through an embedding system i want to be able to do a lookup and say what is each n-gram in this is there an equivalent of that in the knowledge graph and can i do this in all languages right so can i think of uh, a noun in all languages can i think of a pronoun in all languages can i think of relationship mining entity uh, extraction uh, predicate and mining or attribute understanding can i do that in all languages and independent of the language can we have a framework like that now this is not an embedding question this is really about can i bring knowledge graph into my language understanding and in my mind languages are projected on the knowledge graph to understand what we are saying so that is the first part and i think this is one area that again has to be re, re uh, evaluated what is the role of knowledge graphs in language understanding independent of the language and i think we will make a lot of progress if we think like that language understanding is a very non linear process it's not a embedding type process it's a very non linear process suddenly you know something or you don't and it's a look up and all that so how do we get to symbolic understanding of language while we also continue to work on neural understanding of language and how do we reduce the need therefore how do we reduce the need of uh, large corpora to do this because if you look at how humans learn language we don't learn language with a very large corpora so there is something else that is going on in our language centers and i think we need to reintrospect how we are doing nlp and um, i gave a talk earlier about uh, about this whole area of knowledge aware nlp uh, so that is the first problem and the generation part is the easy part right so we know how to generate the answer and especially generate the answer in any language again and this ability to become uh, you know language agnostic 
knowledge dependent and a mix of language and knowledge is going to be another area of a new wave of NLP research, uh, which has to happen. So today we think of knowledge graph separately and language corpus separately, but there's a lot of work that is happening must be, uh, should happen in how do we reduce the dependence on the size of the corpus so that we can do much better understanding and much better generalization more quickly than what we do today with lots of techniques for reasoning chatbot. Also, please share pipeline. Uh, we talked about these techniques, right? This is the slide where I talk about the four basic building blocks. How do you interpret the question? So you need an annotation system which can annotate all the entities. You need a attribute annotation system, a predicate annotation system, and uh, we need a disambiguation system where if I say cricket and all that, and how do you disambiguate uh, entities? So that is the NLP pipeline which will be knowledge aware NLP pipeline to interpret the question. And then the second one that we talked about, analyze the question and generate the reasoning program. This is still an open problem. There is no generic solution to this right now. And this is what I think a lot of research will happen in the reasoning world. And uh, this will come from the old uh, you know, planning and uh, kind of world in the good old fashioned AI world, prologue and theorem proving kind of an approach where we should be able to work backwards and say, if this, this, this is given, what is it that you're really asking, right? And how do we uh, come up with the reasoning program is going to, is an unsolved problem, and hopefully we'll solve it with the traditional uh, symbolic AI kind of thing. Uh, then we need engineering systems to kind of connect a knowledge graph to the, uh, to the program and query that knowledge graph. So that is the generating the answer and continuing the reasoning in the memory and then generating this again we need a language generation system which can be template based or gpt3 based uh, and we can generate so these are four very independent building blocks that are needed to be mastered to get to the full reasoning based question answering is how can i understand more deeply if the language used uses the interpretation of various system languages and has branches or bias I'm gonna put this yes. in the chat. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So obviously the languages are not we think of languages, right? Twitter has its own language. Uh, different chatbots have their own language, and uh, every generation is evolving their own language. So I think uh, the dictionaries are not current. The semantics are not current. Sometimes they're contextual. Sometimes we have a mixed encoding going on between languages. So I think this dirtiness or the noisiness of the language data, a language is making it harder and harder for us to interpret and understand, um, right? With hashtags embedded inside a, a, a sentence, it's not an NLP problem anymore. So I think a combination of statistical NLP and symbolic uh, traditional NLP and knowledge graph together has to come together uh, to solve this kind of a combination of problems. So uh, there's a lot of scope of, uh, of new work going on there, but unless we tie knowledge graph to language, uh, I think that's the biggest piece that will give us the best advantage in the, in the next generation NLP system. I don't know if I answered the question properly. Yes. Okay. That was question from Arthur and one more is from Sanchita. Thank you, sir. Can you explain a bit more about how lesser corpus can also be leveraged in the paradigm suggested by you. How lesser corpus? Right? Can also be leveraged yeah. in the paradigm. Huh? Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, my fundamental question to all of us is, did language come first or knowledge came first? Right, so if you think about this question for a second, actually the knowledge about the world, that it has entities and relationship is more fundamental and we think that language came first, but actually knowledge came first, right? The ability to represent knowledge in all its flavors, and then the ability to communicate knowledge in one language or the other. Now, if I have a very robust knowledge graph in a domain, let's say medical domain, healthcare domain, whatever, agriculture domain, then irrespective of the language, I should be able to interpret that because I'm not building my interpretation systems which are corpus hungry anymore. They are much simpler because I'm doing mostly lookups in the knowledge graph and uh, then building very, very meta models, which are 
relationship mining models or attribute mining models or context mining models. I'm not building proper probability of the next word given the last few word models. And that is what Chomsky said that, you know, uh, measuring the probability of a sequence of words is a very uh, stupid idea. And that's what we are doing in the embedding world. And we have gone a certain direction. We have seen a lot of success, but it is not scalable because there are many languages where we don't have such large corpora, right? So I think there is something that we need to step back but knowledge aware NLP is far more powerful. It can deal with a very small corpus. And because it has helped from the knowledge graph, I think we can do much better and compensate for the lack of corpus with the presence of the knowledge, right? And then we can build uh, next generation interpretation systems, next generation translation systems, and all of that, because now we are knowledge aware the way humans are knowledge aware, right? When we do reading comprehension in GRE, we are not only aware of the paragraph. We are also aware of all the background knowledge that we already have in our brain. And only then we can interpret that piece of text. So we have background knowledge, which is always there. And if you understand this deep idea and being off of the current mindset that only if you have large corpus, then only I can do NLP, that's a completely wrong idea. And therefore, you know, we can work together and see how we can create low language, very powerful interpretation systems because we have a knowledge graph to back it up. Thank you all, bye. Thank you.